Hey, everybody. Um, if you've seen me talk about Crash Python before, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of new information here for you. Um, this is mostly about what I've been doing for the past year, uh, which this time hasn't been a lot of feature development. It's been a response to a lot of the feedback that I've been getting, which is, uh, how do I use it? Can you make it more usable? Uh, how do I know if it's going to work on a particular kernel version? Uh, why does it crash in weird places? Uh, so a lot of the focus for the past year has been on uh, improving in that sense. Uh, if you're not familiar with Crash Python, it's a current kernel debugger written in Python. Um, it sits on top of GDB's Python interface, um, which is pretty rich, but not rich enough to do what we need for a kernel debugger. Um, so I've added a few more interfaces to that. Uh, it supports the concept of register caches inside the debugger. Uh, minimal symbols, which we use all over the place in the kernel, um, which are effectively um, variables in assembly or uh, linker variables where there's just no type information associated with them. Um, the GDB thread API, so I populate the GDB thread list with the contents of the kernel task list. And the target itself uh, to read kdump file uh, is a Python target. Um, it sits on top of the library that Petr Tesezic has written uh, called libkdumpfile. Um, and uh, the library itself is written in C, GDB is written in C, but the, the connections between them go through Python, which makes it really extensible. Uh, it's currently about uh, 11,000 lines of code. Um, most of that is the semantic interpreters. So we have the ability to go into a file system and you know, print that file system's inode or iterate over various data structures. Um, I have a, a facility that I haven't documented in, in this slide deck that I did last year, I think, where uh, it can unravel stack storage. Uh, so you get a request on a SCSI disk, and it's part of a big multipath environment with DM linear on top. And it will unwind from that request back to the offset in the file that that request corresponds to, um, which in legacy crash is a bit of a challenge. Um, I've hosted most of the patches for uh, the GDB extensions. Um, they're not where they need to be yet. Um, mostly I need test cases and documentation and uh, updating to the latest master branch. Um, but that's on my to-do list. I don't want to maintain these forever. Um, so recent development in the past year, uh, I rebased the entire thing to work on Python 3.6. It's now a requirement. Um, Python 2 is EOL at the end of next year. Um, with 3.6 comes uh, Python F strings, which are uh, a lot easier way to do formatted strings in Python if you're not familiar with them. Um, that sort of came along for the ride. Really, the main benefit for 3.6 is that 3.5 brought along the ability to annotate Python code with static typing. Um, 3.5 was function prototypes. 3.6 brought variables. So now you can say, this function needs to have this type, uh, just like we wouldn't see. Uh, it's not enforced at runtime, but you do have a static checker that does the enforcement for you. Um, as a result of all that, uh, a lot of code quality improvements. Um, we now, uh, as part of make tests, go through PyLint, go through MyPy, which uses the static typing, which I'll show in a minute. Um, and just enabling those shook out a, a ton of bugs that people have hit in weird places. And so it's made the code a lot more robust. Um, so the static typing looks a little bit like this, uh, where you have your classic Python uh, variables like this where you don't define the type. You still have your name, and then th that's the expected type. that You still can uh, you know, define a default value. And then the really cool part is you can define like dictionary contents. And this is more like this is a, a dictionary of anything over here. Um, but it makes it so you have data type enforcement, which is pretty powerful for Python to have. Um, now we have better unit testing and static testing. It's easy just to, like I say, just run make test and get feedback on whether or not your code is in the shape it needs to be. Um, we also have live core testing now, which is the more important bit. Because the way it used to work is we just have to prototype up something that vaguely looked like what the kernel would look like in C. So like, you know, uh, have a user space core dump of what a linked list would look like that you'd have to handcraft by hand and then dump and go, oh, well, this is how we iterate over it, which worked well initially. But when we start supporting three, four, five more different kernel versions and we need to get the, the semantic interpretation right on every single one of them, that gets ugly really quickly. 
Um, and so now, uh, actually, can I do that? I need to figure out how to toss the, uh, there we go. That's not really visible, is it? Does anybody know how to increase the font size easily? Yeah. Control plus? There we go. Is that mostly visible? Well, not really. Yeah, let's see if we can do that. Okay, better. So now what we have is there's just these uh, INI files that you define with where the, where the kernel version you want to test is, where the debug info is. Um, it's more or less like what goes into the kernel command, or the, uh, the tool command line, which you'll get to in a second. Where is it? Oh. Yeah, I do. Thank you. And so it's simple. It's not a lot that goes into creating one of these. It's really just telling uh, the tester where to find the files it needs. And so this is really just starting up the debugger and then running the tests through using the same Python test infrastructure that we use for pretty much everything. And so you can call your commands directly. You can call the infrastructure tools directly. Um, and this is executing against a real VM core. Uh, to test some of the more exotic functionality, like the uh, stack storage unrolling, you need to come up with a way to set up a core dump that does what you need. Um, but for basic testing, this will pretty much tell you if you broke something when you added a feature. Um, the next thing I did was simplify the infrastructure. So in the middle of Crash Python, there was this big delayed lookup infrastructure that was used to, uh, at the beginning of your class, you'd just say, hey, I'm going to need these things. And it would populate the namespace of your class with whatever symbols, types, minimal symbols, and some callbacks that you wanted. Um, not always easy to use, and the, the, back, uh, the, the code that backed it was sort of black magic that made it really difficult for anybody new to the project to understand. Uh, so I ripped all that out, and now it just uses a collection that you, you know, establish at the top of your module, and then you use in your class. So where this used to be, uh, you know, you'd need an entire class just for the, the list for each, uh, and you'd in import your struct list head into that using uh, just the special variable names at the beginning that we used to have, and then uh, you'd use it in your namespace directly. Uh, now it's just you, you declare a variable, you can name it whatever you want, and then you just use that directly. So it doesn't pollute the class namespace. Uh, it can be shared. Um, I think it ends up being quite a bit cleaner. Um, this is another example of a bit more complicated uh, type definition. Uh, this one actually returns something. Um, and this you'll need to actually you know, use the typing module to use. Uh, if anybody's interested in the typing stuff in a more uh, detailed manner, we can talk about it after. Um, but it ends up, you know, you can establish iterators, iterables. Um, you can define your own types uh, or say, like, it can be this or this. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, one of the other big complaints that we had with uh, Crash Python last year is that it was really difficult to debug the debugger itself. Um, and a lot of times you just want to be able to step into a core dump and see something really quickly, and you don't need to load all the tasks, you don't need the modules, you know exactly what you're looking for and you want to do it fast. And so now, this is all that's necessary to open a core dump file and be able to work on it in Python. Um, so it's a completely separate module and you can use it separately. We have a few new subsystems. Uh, there's some Hack Week projects this year. Uh, Vlastimil added slab support, and I think you're working on slab support as well. Uh, Giancar worked on uh, block multi queue. Um, we have architecture support partially written for PowerPC and S390. Um, GDB itself is cross architecture, so as long as we have the arch architecture specific knowledge in the debugger, uh, 
then you can run an S390 debugger on L3 slave, which we can't do now. Um, we have some better exceptions. Uh, there are a few different ways. So some of the exceptions are uh, internal to the debugger, where if you f you're starting with the debugger and your context doesn't get established correctly, you'll get a, a more sane error out of it. Um, but also, GDB itself has a bunch of internal exceptions that it wasn't exporting to Python at all. So for example, if you want to dereference a null pointer, you'll get in inside uh, GDB a not available error. But inside Crash Python or the, you know, the Python GDB interface, you'd get just a generic GDB error that doesn't help you. Um, so I exported a bunch of those uh, into the Python API, and now the debugger makes use of them. Uh, startup is a lot easier. Uh, you don't need to know a dozen different arguments to make it work. Um, the example that I have in another window is literally just this, um, where it will go and search a bunch of default locations for debug info, just like it would if uh, you're debugging any sort of user space program. Um, there are a couple of special options uh, where if you specify dash b in a directory, uh, directory name that you have, uh, it's a kernel build directory, uh, it will stop pretending that it's looking through a regular file system hierarchy and go, oh, well, I know where to find the debug info and I know where to find the modules and all of that. Um, <laughs> there's also a dash r option that's targeted at L3 slave where we can just say, uh, this is the root of where you sh should find your files and uh, it doesn't go off to the rest of the world trying to find things where it shouldn't really. And lastly, I have documentation, um, which was one of the big complaints that people had, and if I can find that window here, which I X crashed right as I walked up here. So we have a, you know, a basic introduction, but also um, a command reference. And this is all the commands that we have right now. There's not a lot, but there's enough to get the job done for the most part. Um, and these commands are documented inside the class itself as the doc string at the top. And then the internal API for the entire thing. So we have uh, where's the types? So if you want to have like a K list, you get real documentation for how to use it. So you can write extensions yourself a lot easier than it used to be. Um, so there's some new players in the kernel debugging area. Um, the first one is called Dragon. It's written by Omar Sandoval at Facebook. Um, and it's written to be uh, a Python interpreter. It uses the, the Python interpreter library. Uh, it's mostly written in C. Uh, but the idea here is that it's supposed to be scriptable. It's mostly targeted at running against live kernels. Um, it doesn't have any sort of concept of commands. Um, and it doesn't do stack traces. So it's not quite where we'd like it to be for our use, um, but it's getting there. I think Omar is starting to discover just how much goes into writing a full-fledged debugger, um, which is why I'm happy to use GDB instead of writing my own. Um, but the, the main difference here is that this is really targeted at doing live debugging and Crash Python is targeted at post-mortem. Um, and so I, I need to look into what we need to do, uh, what settings we need for GDB to uh, disable its internal caching so that we can do better live debugging with Crash Python. Um, the debugger itself needs to stop doing so much caching in that sense as well, um, but there's nothing really stopping us from doing it. Um, I wanted to do a demo uh, for, for both this one and the next one, um, but when I started to tell it where the debug info was, it just uh, pinned the CPU for like a half hour and didn't do anything. <laughs> so I, I can't. <laughs> um, 
Oops. Uh, the next one is called SDB, uh, short for Slick Debugger. Um, as part of uh, me starting to document this stuff and get it out there, uh, and Omar doing the same thing, um, I've started to get uh, people interested uh, from outside our normal communities uh, that have a need for a kernel debugger, want to contribute, uh, want to be able to use the stuff that we have. Um, this one is from a bunch of the guys at Delphix, which is a, uh, a file system appliance company uh, that were originally using Solaris. They use ZFS um, and are now switching to Linux, and they want the same debugging tools that they had on Solaris. Um, this one does support commands, um, but what's really slick about it is that um, it doesn't have the infrastructure that we do, but it does have uh, a, a really easy way to teach it about data structure types. So you can say uh, they have a structure called an AVL tree where uh, you can iterate it. And if you just do walk tree, then you get uh, a printed dump of the tree, just like you know, you'd expect pretty easily. Um, but you can pipe it to other commands. And when you have something on the other side of that pipe, it doesn't pass it as text, it passes it as objects. And so you get, on the other side of the pipe, the ability to just print single members, or say you have a tree and off of each node is a list, and you want to iterate the list off of each node, they make that super easy through their interface. Um, we have uh, calls every few weeks um, to discuss how we want to work on kernel debuggers in the future. Um, the biggest problem with unifying them right now is that uh, Crash Python is pretty dependent on the GDB interfaces, and Dragon doesn't implement those. It's a completely different system under the hood. Um, but on the other hand, we have you know, 11,000 lines of semantic interpreters, so uh, there's a lot of benefit to, to what we have still. Um, so we're looking at unifying them. I definitely like to, to borrow the SDB concept of the, those pipelines because that's really powerful. Um, and the combination of being able to put off uh, or build quick one-off helper scripts and be able to write arbitrary commands like that uh, takes care of most of our needs. Um, so that's interesting to me. Um, here are some references if you're interested in following up on it. Um, each of the OBS references uh, contains packages uh, for uh, each of the debuggers. Uh, the Crash Python project also has PyLint, MyPy, everything you need to do make tests on uh, distros that uh, may not be shipping those tools already. So SLE 15 doesn't have uh, the, the Python debugging stuff, uh, so I've added that. Um, and then you know the rest is documentation and where to get it on GitHub. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Just like a room for the order of the uh, session. Or Mike. Or Mike. There was a there was a session of members last week on all this, so the SDB guy were running a session. Yeah, I I, I encourage them to go. And they did, uh, they did mention that they're also working on unifying uh, everything. So having basically their uh, command and pi pipeline uh, 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 handling of commands uh, independent of the, the back end. So uh, either Dragon or Crash Python, whatever uh, they, they can use. So th the session was pretty packed. Clearly a lot of interest in, in people getting better tools for debugging. Great. That push a crash Python to that tumbleweed for the bug. It's getting to the point where I probably could. Um, I know it's installed on L3 Mule now. Um, I think it was on L3 Slave briefly, that, and I didn't install it. Um, but it has a different version of libkdump file that broke the tool that automatically identifies VM cores. Um, so that annoyed some people. Um, but yeah, the, the code is getting to the point now where. Uh, Crashes should be rare enough that we could put it in Tumbleweed. Okay, thanks. <laughs>